a week all over the county. I'm not hard to find right now. But uh, all my town halls are strictly q and I don't do any presentations because I don't know what's concerning you or what questions you have or what suggestions you have. So I always just tell her, like, I start right from the start. You can ask me any questions. I will answer them to the best of my ability, as honestly as my ability. You can give me some suggestions. You give me some concerns. I'll write them down. I'll try to look them up. I'll get your contact information and get back to you. So that's how these run every single time. They almost always run the full two hours until they announce we have to get out of their library. <laughs> so uh, I'll just open it up from scratch just to remind everybody this is a county town hall. I can't talk about anything campaign related. So if you have questions about any races, whether it be mine or somebody else's, I'm not going to talk about those here. Uh, I'll happily talk about them offline uh, another time, but this was announced as a county town hall on a county calendar, so there's no campaign for you to come here. So if anyone has any questions whatsoever, feel free to knock yourself out. Yes, sir. So what will the county commissioner decision not to increase impact fees to the maximum amount cost the residents over the next five to ten years? Five years. That's a, five years. Sure, sure. I'll try to answer. I'll try to repeat the questions as they come. The first question is: the majority of the board decided not to move forward with increasing impact fees to the highest allowable amount. And by allowable, I mean realistic allowable, not hiding behind the state allowable. Impact fees. Just to do a quick summary for anyone who doesn't know, I think most people do, but. There's a couple ways we can pay for things in Manatee County. Some are small, gas taxes and sales taxes and hitting up the state and federal government for, for appropriations. But two of the ways we pay for a lot of the stuff that we provide to you are, are through your general reserve taxes and through impact fees that the developers pay to cover the cost of future growth in Manatee County. The biggest chunk of that is the impact fees. The thought process has always been there's certain things we can pay for with impact fees. Roads and sidewalks, uh, libraries, parks, public safety, like our EMS stations, and there's some piece of law enforcement. Those five things come out of impact fees. Last year, through the last fiscal cycle, which ended last October, we collected $62.2 million from impact fees. That's what developers pay. Whether they're building a house or an apartment or a commercial center or an office building, they pay an impact fee. $62 million is a lot of money, but we're paying over $8 million a lane mile for roads. So when you look at it from that standpoint, it's not that much money considering how far behind Manatee County is on all of our infrastructure. We got a study done and the study says, and it's, there's a lot of tears, so I'll just use rough numbers. The study says we're only collecting about 40 cents on the dollar from what the actual cost of growth is. Not profit center, we're not trying to milk anybody. This is say, if you build this house, you're gonna cause approximately, again, round numbers, $25,000 worth of cost to that, to that group. Those are the additional roads we have to build, the additional libraries we have to build, additional parks we have to build. We're only collecting about $10,000, meaning that's a $15,000 shortfall that either we're taking from you and you're paying for that new house's growth, or we're just not building it. And if you're stuck in traffic all over this town, if you're waiting for Hayden Harbor Park to get built, if you're waiting for the expansion of Rocky Bluff to get done, you know we're just not building it. And every day we get further and further behind to a point where it's going to become more and more impossible ever to catch up. So I have proposed twice formally and many, many times in settings like this that we got a study from professionals way smarter than the seven people on this board of county commissioners, six right now, so you guys don't have one. Uh, six people on this board, they told us what we should be collecting and I said, collect it. That's what they tell us, let's do it. The rest of the board has pushed back consistently and said, no, 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 the state said we can only increase our fees this much, even though we're supposed to be up here. So that's what I'm still fighting. So right now, if you want to extrapolate that, and we're collecting 40%, on the dollar, or 40 cents on the dollar, and we collected over six, about approximately $60 million last year, then you can look at that and basically say, we're probably about $90 million short last year than what we could have collected. Meaning the new construction in the past fiscal year created $90 million worth of cost than they, than they actually paid. 
which means we either built $90 million less for the stuff or took it from you. In some part, we took it from you because in the past 24 or so months, we bonded over $400 million. The debt service on that money is being paid by your taxes, which means those are tax, those are tax dollars I can use to open libraries longer or get more bus routes or build more soccer fields. So that's the situation, right? If you want to look going forward, you said next five, 10 years, well, there's inflation, there's more development, clearly. So if it was 90 million shortfall last year, you're probably closer to like 100 million this year. In fact, in the first seven months of this fiscal year, we took over $45 million worth of impact fees. So you can see it's gonna be higher this year. So you're probably looking at rough numbers, $100 million a year, less than we should be collecting. So over five years, that's half a billion dollars less of impact fees that could otherwise be used to fix your infrastructure. So is there another vote coming up on that or what? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Say there's another vote, because for lack of a better term, what we do up on that diocese vote. Um, yes, we did the first hearing last Thursday to talk about whether or not we want to move forward with, because what they're doing is just saying, increase the impact fees 50% higher than what they are today. And they're saying that's 50% higher than 2015. That's when the study was done. You can imagine what the inflation has been since 2015. Mm -hmm. But what they don't even point out is we're not even collecting 100% of 2015. We're only collecting 90%. And we don't get to true it up. So it's actually a 50% increase on 90%. So we're only really going 35% higher mm -hmm. than 2015. And we can't even take that tomorrow because the state says we have to tier that over four different years of 12 and a half percent a year. So the next fiscal year, if you actually look at it, it's only gonna be about 1.25% higher than what the 2015 growth study reflected. So effectively nothing. So we're getting very far behind. Impact fees are probably the most critical discussion this board can have based on your quality of life. Because that determines whether or not we're gonna have the funds to start catching up your infrastructure, your parks, your libraries, everything else, the school board the same way because they're deferring to us. We're capping at 50, so they're capping at 50. So all these overcapacity schools, all these K through eights, they keep promising, but it's further and further out. It's because they don't have the money either. The only people actually collecting impact fees to the fullest extent of their study are the fire departments who have their own impact fees, but they're so nominal and no developer is gonna push back on a fire department saying they want $200 instead of $150. Just take the money and just go away. Mm -hmm. So they're the only ones actually collecting their full study of impact fees. Us and the school board are both moving forward with detrimentally low impact fees for the foreseeable future. And because the state says we can't increase them more than once every four years, if this board on August 8th, this is the second hearing, votes for this lower raise, we're not going to be able as a board to even consider increasing again for another four years. So what can we do? I mean, I emailed and I got sort of an aggressive email back from Mike Ron, but what, um, what, what can we do to get them to vote the way they should? I wish I had an answer for you. <laughs> um, I mean, they have to know what's going on. I mean, they have to realize the position that we're putting ourselves in in this county. So you can sit there and scream and yell, you want, they're not listening right now. Yeah. Um, I'd say getting people on the board that, that care about Manatee County more than themselves is a good start. Mm -hmm. But once this, moves, once this moves forward, you're locked in for four years. Mm -hmm. You can be looking ahead to four years and say, okay, if, if I got a, if <clears throat> between this cycle and the next cycle, you get four people on that board, day one come year four, get a new study and let's, let's jack these up and get going. That's an unfortunate four years that are gonna be pretty miserable. Because every year, we've had 25,000 new people move here in the past two years. 25,000, and that's a net inflow. That means births, deaths, you name it. Inflow, increase of population, 25,000 in two years. We don't have the money to, to keep this infrastructure up. Like nothing is getting better. And in fact, because we're doing some infrastructure, it's gonna feel a lot worse because eventually we're gonna start working on the, the new bridges. And we're going to start working on Fort Hamer one of these days. And anyone who lives up by Mox and Wallow knows you know, that's fairly miserable at the moment. And I live just south of the bridge, so I know when Upper Manatee starts getting improved. 
So it's gonna feel worse before it feels better. And unless we have the dollars, there's not a whole lot of confidence. It's going to feel better. Um, we need to fix them. I, I, I highly encourage everyone to tell the board, but everyone has told the board. I get all the emails they get, because everyone just clicks, email all commissioners. I see them, I see them all. It hasn't moved the needle. I've yet to see one email come through with anybody saying, please keep those impact fees as low as humanly possible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on it. I'm on it. So, but Thank you what, for trying to uh, get it done. Anyway. Again, we've got some interesting discussions coming up. It's budget season. Uh, so next week, we talk about the constitutional officer's budget. Include, well, we're not going to talk about the sheriff till August, but the rest of them, we talk about some of the rest of our services. We also talk about the CIP and our capital improvement plan is the plan that determines what the county anticipates building in the near term. So like the, the ones that are like the next two years on CIP, those are funded, ready to go, shovel's gonna go on the ground. Let's get the five-year CIP or all the things we've committed that we are going to find funding and we are going to build it. Everything after five years is a wish list for the future and it can be moved around. But that five-year plan is very large in terms of the capital needed. Um, whether or not we have that capital is going to be an interesting question, and it's going to require this board to have real discussion about what do we kick out of there. So um, that may spur some future discussion about impact fees if you put some tangible projects in front of them. Thank you. Speaking of that, um, we have a project with the Moxon Wallow Extension to Bry Road. It's been on the five year CIP. That's a really far off. <laughs> <laughs> you convinced him. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we've had it on the five year CIP. How do we get it to which, the Which one do you have? The Moggison Wall or Mahal. 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 The Mahal. Okay. A little half mile. I've been begging. This is, I'm going to bring this up on Tuesday. Yay. I am. I brought it up to in every CIP, almost to a Thank point you. where they're sick of hearing me. Every month I have a CIP briefing. Every month I have a utility briefing. Every month I have an animal welfare briefing. These are ones I put on my calendar to have the directors and will come to me and, and give me a lowdown so I can keep up with what's going on. Every single month, without fail, I ask when that little piece is going to get built. Yeah. Every single month. Uh, so next week when we have a CIP discussion, I am going to bring that piece up and say knock it off. Because when we took that bridge out on the other side, and everyone said, well, this is no longer a thoroughfare. Everyone in Twin River said, how are we going to get out? Everyone, it, it's, we're locked in here without that bridge. And this board, well, technically a previous board because it's been some turnover, promised that we were going to expedite that piece. Everyone said we already own the land, this is easy, it's a half mile, this is cost effective, let's just get this through. In fact, your former commissioner in this district yeah. pushed for it at the time, but never said another word about it. So I have been actively, proactively begging and pushing to get that piece done. I will find a way of getting that. Can we come done. to the CIP meeting? I mean, we have in the past. It's, you can, it's a work session. Um, there's a lot of other stuff that goes on during that. It's, it's usually a fairly entertaining <laughs> Again, because there's, there's some horse trading going on. You, they, they come to us and say, here's the money we're anticipating. Here's the projected amount of money. This is the project. This number is way higher than this number. What are we doing here? And this is when conversations come up about roundabouts and intersections. This is where conversations come out about little stuff pieces of roads. This is where conversations come out which ones are we widening and where the priorities are and, and things about boat ramps and park. It's, it's pretty relevant uh, compared to some of the rest of the budget. I mean, you can just sit there and listen to us talk about the well, that, tax we, collector's budget. Can citizens, uh, make What's that? citizens make comments? What's that? Can citizens At the end of the meeting, there'll be a, a citizen comment okay. section to it. Um, but yeah, I have been pushing for that. I'm well aware of that piece. And Public Works is sick of hearing me ask about it. <laughs> so hopefully one day they build it just to shut me off. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You had your hand up too. Okay. Hold on one second. Yes. I got a lot of questions. So, <laughs> the hands are keep popping up behind you. So now well, we're I, I, I'm a resident who lives in Eagle Trace, <coughs> okay. and there's um, going to be a planning commission August 15th to consider rezoning a 20.2 acre parcel that's owned by the Langfords from urban fringe to ROR. And 
I guess my concern is the developer is asking for um, 300 units to be built on the property. And basically, I'm a spokesperson for our community, not just myself. We've done a couple of meetings amongst the people. Have we spoken before on the phone? Yes. Okay. All right. They're very nice, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you spoke to me for about an hour, I couldn't believe it. So. Um, so, my question is I mean, they want to change it to ROR, so they want to use 4.7 acres in the frontage on along State Road 64 for commercial and then 15.5 for residential. And I went through all the, like, the codes, and the, I just am completely confused about how many residents per, how many units you can build on the acreage. Hmm. And after you include um, a pool, an amenity center, a parking lot, uh, and that's another question. If you have 300 units, how many parking spaces are required for that amount of units? Okay. And what is the what is the square footage or the size of the parking space? Because when I figure it out, it's only not 15.5 acres after you take away the commercial area, the parking lot, um, and other things. It's like 11.7 acres. So. <laughs> All right. How many so where are we going? Can you here? Call them here. <laughs> ROR density, parking ratios, parking sizes. The density, yeah, the 300 units on. I'm they, trying to, I'm just going to turn around. Yeah. Um, also, they're planning to put a vault, uh, water collection vault system parking lot system to collect water under the parking lot because okay. it's kind of in a what wet I area understand. so i mean i'm getting way ahead of myself because the developer told us that yeah. so well you're getting you're sort of getting ahead of yourself yeah. i can't actually answer your real questions that's what right. i'm trying to come up with because right. right. it's, it's it's an ongoing project it. it's quasi-judicial so I, i'm not going to speak not only can i not speak directly to it but we haven't gotten the information yet um, it hasn't come before our board yet, it's not our agenda, so I can't speak specifics. I can speak in general terms, and that will probably terms. help you without okay. talking about a project. Okay, so ROR is one of the highest intensity zoning we have. Um, it's retail Dance office, board. it's retail office residential. Um, it, so what they're trying to, okay, not what they are trying to do, huh? So it's urban fringe um, right now. Jen's videoing me, so I gotta make sure um, I don't violate any kind um, of uh, expert techniques. Charlene asked me to, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so we've got a, it sounds like, hypothetically speaking, if somebody wanted to build additional density, we currently have an incentive in our comp plan, which is legally binding incentive, for mixed use density votes. So if you build a certain amount of commercial, you get to double the density of the residential. I've been trying to remove that since I think my first land use meeting uh, for two reasons. One, I think giving someone a density bonus just as the promise to give them free commercial doesn't make sense. The free commercial should be the density bonus, not also giving them something else. They already got something for free. Two, people do that instead of using the affordable housing density bonus because it's the same density increase. And all they're building is Starbucks's and ABC Liquors and another car wash instead of actually building the housing that we need. So I, I think it's a, it's a poor incentive, but it sounds like this is along those lines. If you do that and it's on a major corridor, which 64 is a state road and qualified, you can get up to 20 units per acre. So if they're using 15 acres and they're building 300, that's approximately 20. That's what they're doing. And the commercial is going on the front piece. That's where that's coming out. Uh, relative to the parking lot itself, uh, your first question was how many parking spaces they need. That's a little subjective. I'm not a huge fan of parking ratios. I think developers should take their own gamble. If they don't build enough parking, people won't rent their place. They have to lower the rent until they find somebody with one car. That's their problem, not my problem. Um, I don't like those regulations. However, our rules are, by default, 1.8 parking spaces per unit. That's the, the rule. Um, it used to be higher, it used to be two per unit, plus one for every 10 units for gas. Now it's just 1.8, it's the, the rule of thumb. Uh, it can be lower if you build a four to four. However, the, the size of a parking space isn't relevant to 
your discussion per se. Because when you're calculating density, you don't net out the pool and the clubhouse and the parking. That's net density. Gross density is what you're referring to. That's 15 acres, 20 units per acre, 300 units. That's gross. You take the gross area that, of the entire development to calculate that. Net density is, okay, now if I consolidate them in certain areas because of parking, wetlands, clubhouses, that's a whole different number. That may be 30 units per acre. It depends on what the zone is. That means you can cluster 30 of them in this one acre here, even though collectively on average, you're at 20. So the parking is relevant in terms of how much you have to cluster everything together. Um, we had a perfect example of that way, way out in Mayaka with a golf course. That golf course was 500 and something acres. Um, the, the way that they were building the units, it was like 94 houses. It was one house per five acres. But what they proposed was, hey, we're gonna build all the houses right here in this one little area of only 10 acres or something like that, half to one acre lots, and then leave the other 500 acres empty. They were putting a golf course there. It kept them away from the river, kept them away from the wetlands. So gross, they only built one house per five acre. Net, they built substantially more, but it's all clustered in one place. Well, kind of. I, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. The other question I had does we had summer house project built to the west of our development. I live in Greyhound. So yeah, yeah, so you know. Yeah. So I called you and complained about the commercial component of that apartment complex was, which was also mixed use. Use so that as an it example took, of why I hate that density. That yeah, it took four. They're not even completed. It's taken four years to develop that property, the commercial component of Summer House. So we had to live with garbage, construction vehicles for four years. Now, this Pendler development is planning to put commercial on. And so are we gonna have to experience another four years of a mess on 64 and I can't, I can't answer that one because I can't speak specifically. Are there any requirements that the state has as far as completion of commercial property? Yeah, but it's much, it's much longer than four years. Um, there's certain, it's not a, it's not a state, it, it, it's, when, when you get a plan approved, it, it expires, it sunsets at some point in time. That's like eight to 10 years. Depends on the plan, depends on if it's a DRI. These are all terms, it, it's way outside the scope of this conversation. Different plans have different expiration periods. They're a lot longer than four years. Some people just take time to build things. Some people get a rezone for a much larger, I mean, they're still building Heritage Harbor. That started forever ago. They're still building Terra. That started when I was a kid. Like there's still really a lot of them. So there's, there's long processes here. So you can't just say, okay, you got approval, you have to build it all in 12 months. They give people some leeway to build. If you're gonna build commercial, you need to go find that, you gotta get the permits, you gotta go find the tenants. You're not holding anybody under a gun. But there should be some common sense into that. Oh, it should, I, you I, know, don't, I don't no disagree. That's sense. why I hate that. We've had some terrible, terrible mixed use incentive proposals. I use that one. I use someone else's one as one of my key examples because when people think mixed use, you think walkable community. You think you're going to walk out to a coffee shop and then go grab a slice of pizza and then you're going to go to your co work space. You've got a liquor store, a gas station, a car dealership, Popeyes. or a cup thing, a Popeyes, and now an auto zone. That's not mixed use. That's not, com that's not commercial for the community. That's right. just commercial for commercial. The worst case was on university, which I almost lost it. Um, somebody bought shoot the land straight. next to the Shoot Straight yeah. gun, you know, gun range. That Shoot Straight's been there forever. Someone bought the land next to it, partnered with the gun range, and said, this is mixed use because we have commercial, even though it's existing commercial, which is just a tilt up warehouse. For and they got and the rest of the board voted to give them double the density as a mixed use incentive. I have another question about tree preservation. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, on the 20 acres, there's some mm -hmm. mature trees that line the north side of Eagle Trace. Oh. I mean, maybe 50 years old, very mature. Is there any way that our community could request a tree preservation survey on that site? You can, you can, um, if they're like big royal oaks, if they're over a certain dimension in terms of, uh, what do they call that term? 
the width of the trunk. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, it may not even be the right word, but that was the word I was looking for. <laughs> um, if it's over like 24 inches, it falls different. We have a tree fund, and we have technically, we have restrictions on what percentage of the trees you can take down, especially when it comes to the entryways. Entryways are, are treated differently. You're supposed to retain 75% of the trees in the entryway. Uh, people come to us for approvals and ask for stipulations to avoid that, but technically that's in our, our code. If you take trees down, we go and inventory them before you take them down, unless you game the system, and I can explain how that's done too. Um, and then you have to pay a fee for every tree you take down. You have to replace all the trees with different trees, and there's a fee you pay, and it goes into a tree fund that we use to put royal palms in your media. Um, but th th there are exceptions. People have changed the system. I've, I've, I've talked to the state about it. Technically, you're allowed to scrape all the trees out of a site if it's an ag site. Um, so what a lot of developers do, especially out east with the intention of developing, is they scrape all the trees and clear cut it all down without any implication or restrictions of what they can do because they say it's ag, but then two minutes later they go and get a rezone for three houses per acre and say, no trees here, and they're done. Um, my argument to the state was if someone's going to use the ag exemption to take down trees, they should be required to retain it as ag zoning for a minimum of five years mm -hmm. and force them to not just rip all the trees out uh, and gain them. Another question is dealing with the water. <laughs> this is your last question for now. Like, I'll, I'll, right. I'll come back right. to you. Right. Time right. for me. No, 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 no. Oh, I hear your last one. Oh. Never move. I, I called the county quite a while ago and spoke to, I don't know, must have been a, a secretary or something, because I was concerned about, about the amount of development versus the amount of water that the county has. And how do they actually plan if they know Manatee County will have enough water for the amount of building they're doing and residents that we have in the county? Poorly. We plan poorly. Mm -hmm. um, but we do plan. We do plan. Our, we do have a very good utilities department, but they can't create water out of that air. Um, we fortunately have Lake Manatee. We're the only county in the immediate area, or possibly any area in the state of Florida, that has its own self-sufficient water supply. Everyone else is part of water, well, technically we are too, is part of a water authority. Our water authority is Peace River Water. Um, we're in it with us, Sarasota County, Charlotte County, DeSoto County. We collectively own Peace River Water Authority, the plants over in DeSoto, just south of Arcadia. At any point in time, we, Manatee County, can begin buying water from Peace River. The intent is not to do that for as long as humanly possible, uh, if at all, because it's going to be much more expensive. One, their water rates are much more expensive. And two, because it's it's, it's shared water, uh, so it's supply demand. But two, the infrastructure to get the water to us is going to be very expensive. The last estimate I saw, just the piping to get the water from Peace River to connect to our system is probably close to $300 million. I think it was like $278 million last time I saw it. That's just the pipes. That doesn't count. We need to have storage at Peach River to store the water before they bring it over to us. They're building a, 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 a reservoir right now that's being shared between Charlotte County and Sarasota for the most part. That reservoir is costing almost $600 million. Uh, Sarasota just floated $300 million in utility bonds solely to build their part of a hole to store water. So it's going to be very expensive to get water from them. Inevitably, at some point, we probably are going to have to. Um, but we're trying to avoid that. I, that's why I do monthly utility briefings, because there are some other options. We're looking at buying as many well credits as possible. We're looking at expanding our capacity or treatment plant. We're working on reverse osmosis up at Buffalo Creek. Uh, does this solve our problems? No, the, the reverse osmosis Buffalo Creek is like 5 million gallons per day. You know, we're, we're using 60 million gallons per day, so does that help? Sure, but it's a 10% increase. That right now, our study, because every year we have to turn in a study to Peach River showing, here's our trend of growth, here's our trend of anticipated water use, so they know roughly when we're gonna come online for them, so they can plan for it. When I got on the board, the estimate was 2037. Last year, it was 2035. So if it gives you an idea of how quickly we're growing versus capacity, just in my three and a half 
close to four years on the board, that anticipated date has already come in two years. So we're going in the wrong direction here uh, and grow the business slowing down. So it's something that, that we need to be cognizant of. We need to start reserving for, planning for. And again, we are planning for it. I, I don't want to imply we're not. I mean, our utilities department focuses on I had or my utilities department go to Altamont Springs because they had a unique way of creating potable water. And I sent my utilities department, I'd go talk to Altamont Springs. Uh, so we are working on it, but it is, we are looking at a 10 to 12 year window of current capacity water, and we're looking at ways of expanding that capacity. Well, well, oh, wait, wait, oh, I have someone over here, and then you, go ahead. Um, bottom line is I would like to know what we need to do with these developers to make them listen to us and not just check boxes. Thank you. Amen. Okay, that that's just blunt. Okay, because we were on, you know, they they do these whatever meetings. Like we just had one this week. Okay, they literally waited. They did it an hour. Didn't allow you to speak. Mm -hmm. They cut it off. Okay, when they was like another thirteen hands raised. Okay, mm -hmm. you're talking about a neighborhood meeting. No. Yeah. No, that online. It was. Yeah. Neighborhood meetings. Neighborhood meetings. This one was, was, neighborhood neighborhood yeah. this one was okay. specific with the developer for the Yort spot that's mm -hmm. off of uh, Rye Road. Um, and I mean, I have never seen a meeting run so strictly, where no video. I mean, and then they just said, "We're done." They didn't say, okay, well, all of the hands raised now, we'll, we'll extend the meeting and we'll answer those, but no more. I, I can tell you why that happened. They're checking and, the box. And again, I don't even know who the developer is, nor do I care, because that's way, and that, if they're in a neighborhood meeting, that's way before it's gonna get to me. Manatee County, and for that matter, I, I don't know how many counties, if any, do, I know the state doesn't require them. We don't require them to have that neighborhood meeting. They literally did not have to have five minutes of that Zoom meeting. My argument to development services was, especially if it's a development over a certain size or surrounded by certain areas, that we should make it mandatory. I was told, oh, that's out of the ordinary, that no, nobody's gonna want it. I'm like, no, the only people who aren't gonna want it are the developers who have to do it. Uh, I try to make them mandatory that they're in person uh, with a Zoom option to make them actually sit in front of people and answer questions instead of calling technical glitches on things. But right now, they, they do. Uh, we've had them start going sideways, and then all of a sudden Zoom happens to shut down. Uh, I tried to make a mandatory. I got pushed back on it. It's still something I talked to though. But that's the, the, the reality of it. Since it's not required, if 13 hands are going up and they know this is going to be like a nightmare for them, they can just well, end it because I mean, there's nothing required. We would have respected them saying, okay, we're, you know, the hands are up right now. The meeting was supposed to end now. We will take the answer, you know, answer the questions of the hands that are up now, but no more. Got that, okay? But when your hand's been up for the last half hour and they just went ahead and cut off the meeting, um, specifically, what are the rules around ingress and egress? And what do they, how and why, what all goes into those requests by the develop? The, the developer and how they're answered by the county. Yeah, that's so broad. I'm not trying to skirt your answer. I'll answer everything I can, but that that's very dependent on so many different things. That depends on how many units are inside of it, okay. whether it has to be one or two. It depends on if it's F dot road or R's or What's MPOs the simplest involved. or it's, what, it's location what is location and proximity to an intersection? What's involved. the requirement to notify anybody around there? Nothing. What there's are those literally rules? no no. There's no requirement to have a neighborhood meeting mm -hmm. at all. There's just not. I, no I'm requirement not. to tell you that we're going to build this. No requirement to say that. No no gonna... no no. That's two different things. There, we we do notice future projects. They all have to get noticed by law. Um, there are some exceptions now, but for the most part, so you can go onto our website and see public notices. You can see that somebody's proposing to do something and get information on it. All of those meet, again, with a few exceptions, all of them have to be publicly noticed and presented and give the public an opportunity, both at the planning commission stage and the, the board of county commission stage to give your comments and hear the story. So th there is requirements to notice you. Um, there isn't requirements to 
survey the neighbors to see where the entry should be from an ingress egress that has to do with traffic studies in fact we just had that we had a project that came on shade and university came to us like two months ago uh, i think it's been more than 30 days i could probably say it now um it came to us they were going to build a car wash we all we all said hey wait a minute the, the ingress egress on this is terrible you're going to jam up all the, the traffic on shade and there's broadway and all these other roads behind there we declined it well i, I don't think we declined it. i think they asked for a continuance because they knew it was going to be declined because of ingress uh, and ingress they came back to us and changed the whole landscape of how the people were, the cars were going to stack and everything else and redid it and they added a, a slip turn lane that they were going to pay for themselves and then it, we, it got approved because but they meaningfully changed it entirely the, the entire argument of that was how are you going to get people in and out of there so it does come up it is focused on our traffic team and public works do focus on that they provide a study to us for every project oh, well i'm in twin rivers and south oak was put there it was supposed to be the same type of development at ours oh. they tripled the amount of houses we were never told never asked never noticed nothing in fact we were lied to told that it was never open up that it was going to be it was a dead end it was a circle that's what it was now you've got two na two different named roads i mean it and now we're just being cut off on the fact that Rye Road and Golf Road are just exploding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we can't get nowhere with anybody. I, I hear you. Rye is going to have some improvements based on the development agreement with Rye Ranch. Um, that's a matter of when they put that in. Golf course is on the CIP. Uh, again, it all comes down to there's a lot of need in Manatee County. I'll go back to the very first question. The very first question was, was about the infrastructure and impact piece. The reality is, anybody on this board, anyone in this county can sit here and tell you, we care about infrastructure, we're going to fix infrastructure. Go watch, I'm not talking about campaigning, I'm just thinking in general terms. Go listen to anyone campaign. Everyone's like, infrastructure, look at their mail, infrastructure. You can't build infrastructure unless you have roads, and unless, I mean, unless you have funds. And if you're not committed to getting the funds to build it, then you really don't care about the infrastructure. You're, you're just lying. I can tell you all day long. I, I'll tell you right now, I'm gonna widen golf course to four lanes and ride a six lane. No, I'm not. I can tell you. <laughs> but it, unless I've got $250 million, I'm not doing it. And right now, I do not have $250 million. I'm being honest with you. All of our infrastructure is behind because the entirety of impact fees from the minute we collected the very first dollar of impact fees back in the 80s was 100% a Ponzi scheme. And you can only you can only fix your infrastructure by collecting the next guy's impact fees, and I can't fix their infrastructure until I get the next guy's impact fees. That's literally how a Ponzi scheme works. But we're not collecting the next guy's impact fees anymore. So the people way way back in the day who are still living on Ellington, Gillette, and Erie, and all Canal, and all these other roads, they're still waiting their turn. They're never going to get their turn because now all these new people are building roads for themselves with impact fee credits and not even giving me impact fees anymore. Mulholland has been on the book since what, like 2000? Which part of Mulholland? We're not doing the bridge. The, the piece that's coming this way, it was literally, it was structured on the plans. Mm -hmm. Like way, way back. Are you talking about the west side or east side of the east? East. 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 east side. Oh, the one that we talked about right. a minute ago. Yeah. Yeah. Same yeah. 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 Like I said, I hear you on that. There's <laughs> say. I'm just literally it waiting for them to build done. that road. It should have been done before South Oak went in. It should have been done. I mean, it should have. I don't disagree. And we're still being told that it's not even on the five year plan. Because it's not on any plan at the moment. Because yeah. it's got to be quote unquote funded. That's why we have the, on Tuesday, we have a CIP. There's, there's a few so projects. Why aren't we telling the developers they need that are all of the. I mean, how many developers are developing off of Wide Road right do, now? Do you, well, I'll tell you. I'd be careful saying that because. Right now, my answer from staff is we are telling a developer to build that little extension because there's a new development proposed just to, you know, on Rye on that empty parcel right there, which that would be the top little hat to it. Yeah, right that's there. your, yeah. yeah. so what I'm getting told is we were hoping that they would come forward and get approval and that piece of road would be in the development. So 
The it's proposal, not even on their plan. I know it's not. Mm -hmm. But my point is, you're asking why don't we make developers do it? Staff's like, let's make developers do it. They may not build that for five years. So I'm trying to skirt that and have us build it instead of the developer's ability. Because if you wait for the developer's ability, you ain't never seen that. Right. Well, the developer's going to look at you, just this one in particular, will look at you and say, well, why am I only the one responsible no. for all of these other ones? No, their development agreements are pretty specific. I mean, you like Rye Ranch is building a yeah. lot of roads. Um, Lazy C is doing intersection. Part of, part of their development agreements require them to do it. Like they have to do it. If they sign that development agreement, they are literally on the hook and have to. So, but, but they do it somewhat on their own time. So that's why I'm trying to get things like that. Because again, we sit here and build $200 million roads all over the place. We have little things like this, like just get it fixed. You're helping the entire community for, exactly. it's not free by any stretch, but it's pennies on the dollar compared to some of the other stuff we're doing. Uh, and plus we yeah. promised it so right. I totally understand the cost of construction I yeah. do it every day but yeah. I mean I also understand having somebody in your back pocket mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what it's boiled down to well that's the truth right there you just said it good for you uh, it's blunt I mean, it's just what good it is for you. good for you thank you um, <clears throat> this just ties into some of the things that have been said um, I live in Becca State subdivision. There's several of us here from that subdivision. It's an older subdivision right off of 301, just a couple miles down the road. But then between um, the Lutheran Church and on the one side and on the, and on the end of it is the new construction plan for Dalton Medical Office. Mm -hmm. okay. um, my question's about zoning, but can I give a few things about um, background? On, on our concerns. Sure. Um, the two last parcels of our neighborhood um, were where the, the development is, is being built or been planned. And uh, the change, the, the districting for our, well, there's about 100 houses in the subdivision. And the front part is residential 4.5. Um, the back part is residential 3. So what they want to do is change the zoning. They were, they, I had been told, I called a couple of years ago, they said it would take, it would take um, a lot of, I get nervous talking, so I'm sorry. Take okay. <laughs> uh, it, there had to be a process to go through, and what they were talking about with the community meetings, that's what I was told like three years ago when the property first went up for sale and there was some issues with the road in front of it begin with which is why I called but it had nothing to do with it but anyway <clears throat> um, they said there was supposed to be community meetings and that's what you were just talking about so, so community meetings and I was expecting to get notices as we were all talking about it, what's going on how can they advertise it for commercial and they're um, there's nothing going on and we're waiting and waiting and finally they came through and just started mowing down all the trees on the property and this is going to be built and I just end, end it right here and I'm rambling, I'm sorry. But um, I never did, I did get some answers from people but it, it wasn't really to the satisfaction of us because we, we expected to have some input. I mean, if you wow. see things in, with input at, in the county meetings, people come up and they talk about the concerns, traffic, impact on the neighborhood, Basically, the um, admin it was done administratively. They, they just designated that to be commercial. It was okay to do that. They put a temporary building there. Um, we didn't get to talk about the traffic implications or any of the other things. And then the, the zoning part, if this is rezone commercial, which I know it will be, it's just going to go right through, um, <clears throat> then what is the what what could be the impact of from the church all the way down in the front of our neighborhood becoming a commercial just just as people as people sell to these developers that come in each home may be selling for lots of money oh we can put what were we talking about a, um, a gas station, a gas station yeah. in front of our house i mean you know this is just I mean, it's probably speculation all the way down the road, but it's been very upsetting. 
Yeah, you know, the neighborhood's been there over 40 years, and we, I've lived here 45 years. I've never had an issue like this come up anywhere I've lived in Madison County. Yeah, so I'm going to have to email you, and you can give me a little more specific, because that, if it really went from residential to commercial, that cannot be administra administratively approved. It, it, just phys it, it, phys it physically cannot, by, by law, it, it cannot. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it would have to come in front of the board. Of the only way something's administratively approved is if it's already zoned one way and it's just a site plan or development or agreement approval yeah. for something that's being utilized within the zoning that it's already in. So going from residential to commercial, unless it was a certain zoning, like an ROR, for instance, I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying if it was, where it allowed for both and you just happened to hear someone was contemplating residential and they quote commercial, that wasn't a change of zoning or change of use, right. but it doesn't sound like that's the case. You said it was four and a half and three. Four and a half and um, three. We're yeah. on the three side. So, on so the that half. could be the only other time you can administratively approve anything and it's required by state is if you use live local and that's specific to affordable housing, not commercial. So let me get more information from you because I'll look it up and I'll give you a better handle on what happened because that way we can have a better idea of what is going on with that parcel for you. But also it gives you hopefully some peace of mind or concern depending on what our answer is about the rest of the parcels in that area. So let me get the specifics from you So and I'll look that up for you. And can, can I say one thing about the row 99? It, it's in, I've got the paperwork and I will get together later. But anyway, that road that was put in here that's in the, that's in the frontage of where this, this uh, development is going to be or the, where they're going to build this medical center was always a private road. Suddenly it's now a county road. I had talked to someone in transportation three to four years ago because there was road issues. That had been put in, we know who put it in privately. There wasn't a sign private, but it was just done by someone in a neighborhood for the good of the neighborhood. They just did it because they were in construction or some such thing. So that little road is not big enough to accommodate the amount of traffic that's, the, the, the wear and tear is, sub, I think your word they use is substandard. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult uh, to get two trucks can't go by and then they're parking in the right way. Yeah, we, we have a number of roads like that. Yeah. Um, it's in front of our house. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I, I'm just saying, like, you, can, you, can 60, you can 69th, when Fort, Ham when Fort Hammer's being built, 69th, like cutting down that way, I mean, that, yeah. everyone was going two directions was on that, because everyone was trying to get to the high school off of 301, and that didn't fit two cars either. Uh, but it's not uncommon for a, I'm not saying it's common, but it's not uncommon, unheard of to have a private road get transferred or just like some developments and, and bigger stewardship district build their utility systems and then turn it over at the end of the day someone just gets sick of you know that's the problem everyone wants to build roads and utilities and they brag about these brand new shiny assets they have but five minutes later you got to maintain those things and now it's just a liability until it becomes a liability that the original developer doesn't pay for and they're just like here you take it and we're like we don't want anything to do with it like well these are your constituents right here, so we're just going to let this thing fall into disrepair. You better take it. And then we did. But the bigger issue is, you know, the part of the neighborhood being divided, I'm just concerned about that in our future. Mm -hmm. A lot of us have been here for years. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a small community, number one. And number two, when they bulldozed the trees and went in and, as she indicated, I like this tree being so straightforward with everything, um, they put up some trailers okay. and made it into their medical center for right now but they intend to build the building on the further part of that parcel okay. so and are they doing that so they can hold off some time keep the business going till they get that approved i don't know i don't care i'm more concerned about our neighborhood <laughs> Yeah. And what it's doing, we have a gentleman back here as well. Right next door to that thing. Right next door. I mean, they've got the party potty right next to his house. Yeah. I mean, it's great. Oh, I have a better view. Now you can sell your house with a two bedroom. Seriously. In all honesty. You got to tell me that there's, they have to put some kind of berm, a barrier, uh, something there, because I have a front row view of 301 now. And it's and it's it's ugly, man. It, it's disgusting. There's all kinds of construction traffic that are parking on my right of way. Yeah. Which, by the way, you know, I know I don't own that part, but I do maintain it. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like I should have some right to that. I called I called the yeah. code enforcement to see if I could put up no parking signs or something. They said, no, nope. no, you can hang it on your fence and someone make you take it down. That's what it was. Yeah. I mean, yeah. no, you know, it's just that it's Like she said, they never, yeah. ever, ever once. There, no. I never saw a yellow sign to say there's a notice. I, like I said, I, I've never seen it. This never came in front of the board. So that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Get me, uh, I get me, get me information. I don't have an answer for you because it doesn't make sense. Is this a misunderstanding? Are they using something illegally? They're not supposed to. Is it going to shut it down? Is it a zone differently? And it was just a confusion. Because this never came in front of us. So it's either, so either zoned properly from the start. Usually people don't just open up medical businesses in uh, And then the what a duty calls, no offense, but you know, like a duty calls is literally as you would just. You know, look out your window. That's now you have an extra bath. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, can you imagine what's at a forty party duty cause? That's what you're staring at when you look out your window. And you're so, like, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. Yeah, so, I feel like I can look it up. But, but give me yes. give me information. Your contact. I will. Sit with development services, research this parcel, understand exactly what's going on, both of you. And I will get back to both of you and tell you exactly what's going on. My wife has been in contact with a, with your not your office, but Mr. Satcher's office. And she doesn't work there. I know. <laughs> she had contact and, and they kept giving her a line of uh Will yes. about this whole thing because she's been asking this question for the last asking, two years. I, wait, this is my wait. This is my third town hall at this library. Where were you before? Let me look it up so I can give you real information so that I have I I George Cruz or from his following he always posts that. And yeah. what happened was, yeah. they gave one who was really good a short time to get out because they're going to put it into the liquor store. So they were scrambling to try to find some place to put a temporary place so they could go keep business. And most of their patients are in parish, so they were trying to get as close. As yeah, but you can't just I mean, I mean, stop down wherever you want. Yeah. I mean, so maybe they got a temporary use permit pending yeah. rezone. Yeah. So maybe this is something that will be coming to us, and they just got a temporary use permit for 12 months or something. So there's lots of explanations, but until I have facts, I'm not doing you any good. So let me get the information in your contact. Yeah. Is this about porta potty? No, but it should be about it. I personally don't want to step back a little bit. Earlier conversation about the, the water supply uh, uh, after the parish meeting, uh, I went and looked at that SIP for the county, and I noticed a lot of millions, many millions of dollars going into the dam and the water treatment plant to reinforce the dam. Uh, uh, the question I have on that is, uh, once they get that dam completely reinforced. Is one of their ways of getting more water is to, is to uh, dredge that lake so it stores more water? It's been a look at. That isn't really the intent of the money in the dam. The intent of the money in the dam is it's a yeah. 50 to 70 year old. 50 year old. Yeah. This, is more, this is more general maintenance, more right. so than an expansion of or, or strengthening of a dam. This is making sure the dam's functioning. Yeah. Doesn't uh, uh, correct. So what you're seeing in terms of that cost is just the, the cost of maintenance of an existing dam. Right. You kind of don't want the dam to break, uh, especially as you live on the, the banks of, of the river. Well, I'm not up to dream, so I'm good. <laughs> 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 even, even with the dam in place, when we open the locks, we have to notice all the, the residents because right. it floods all the backyards, just because of the water flow coming out. If that dam broke, that would completely flow. 
So that's what you're seeing. You're not seeing an expansion of a dam for the future. It has been looked at from, from a dredging standpoint. Right. It's very cost effect, uh, very cost complete, I guess, uh, to, to do so. And we still have restrictions. We're, we're restricted, not based on how much water's in there, but how much water we're permitted to take out of there. Um, so just, you can, you can dredge that thing another 50 feet down, but we still can only take the same amount of water out. That's why we're out buying well credits and doing other things to give ourselves permission to use, that's, that's why government sucks, is we're asking the government permission to use our own water for our own citizens, and they're restricting how much water we can use. If we had the ability to use more of the water, we do have more water. We just can't use all of it because we're restricted by how many yeah. millions of gallons per day we can take out and treat based upon our permits. All right, but that, and that was just a follow up on her question. My the one I came here for was um, looking at the county's uh, uh, growth map, your FDAB, your future development area boundary, um, is currently quite far east over here in the, the parish area. Um, and then it goes around the lake. And I believe especially now that I've seen uh, some of the finance things that Faulkner is uh, contributing heavily to the campaigns, um, that there's an intent to move the FDAB. If I moved it. Um, at least to Vernon Bethany. You've already paid, uh, authorized $12 million to four lane 64 all the way to Vernon Bethany. Um, so they're studying that right now. That's a state road though. That's yes, state. yes. But it's, if you're gonna four lane it out there, that's build it and they will come um and Faulkner owns thousands of acres over there they're already here um <laughs> I got <laughs> the, uh, the, and so um, i suspect that they're going to to straighten out that fdab and take it all the way from the east end here and run it all the way out um so that they can develop it's not going to move it south of the lake though I mean, it goes the, the current you guys know what he's talking about future no. So, okay. We have a line that was created back in 2000, I guess. It's, it's jogged very slightly since it first came up. But um, for the most part, since 2000, it's pretty much been the same place. And that basically says, this is our, our, our future development area boundary. We have this. And you can build west of it to your heart's content. Well, not your heart's content, bad choice words. But if you build west of it, we as a county have some ownership responsibility for the infrastructure, the utilities, like you're building in areas we deem perfect. So we'll make sure you've got your adequate parks and your roads, all the stuff we talked about that we can't actually build you, but we promise you we will. <laughs> <laughs> east of that line, east of that line, we have no fiscal responsibility over there. We don't have to provide roads, utilities, things like that. Some of it we can, but we're not required to do so because you're building where you're kind of not supposed to anyway because you're outrunning our, our ability to fund growth. And that's the real problem. That's the problem with the, the right. policy 2.1.2.8, which allowed it, isn't even the, people, some people don't like it because of the cows, but I don't like it because I hate wasting money. And we, we've outgrown, we've, we've grown out past our ability to fund that growth. So right now that line on the south side of the county goes straight up more side. Bornside is the line until you get to the river. Then it kind of goes up, then it jogs around and hits 675 up the top of Rye. Then it, whoever paid off people to move this thing on the other side of their line and stuff, it, it jogs around a bit. Every year, every election, every time anyone has a conversation, the conversation is when's that line going to move? Um, and that's been coming up recently because of the new policy that technically allows people to build on the other side of it. And we've had five projects come in front of us to build on the other side of it. Tail Ranch and East East River Ranch South. Uh, Can they south piggyback? Side. Once uh, this one's approved, well, we we got 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 to the next one to say, I'm continuing. This is a wild man. Can they piggyback on the That policy is what we need. That policy does not do what that policy was supposed to do. I've, I've made three motions to rescind that policy and take it out of our comp plan because nobody thought about it. Nobody understood how damaging that policy was going to be. Now we have a proof of concept, and I've tried to remove it over and over and over again uh, unsuccessfully. That said, that development east of the line, those five projects, 
It's those two, Lazy C, Cone Ranch, so and there's a different part of Cone Ranch. Um, so five, technically, all two of them are the same project. Those projects are still, at least of the FDL, we do not technically have any responsibility to build their infrastructure <coughs> or run the pipes for water or anything else. That is the responsibility of the developers to pay for that entire. We've now seen in the past 60, 90 days, that is not factually correct. Um, our staff is now making the claim that technically that policy says they only have to provide the absolute bare minimum going out that way. So as long as the developer just builds a two lane road out there and we as the county determine it really should be four, that you, the taxpayer, will pay for the other two lanes, even though the entirety of that road is only for the people moving into the area east of the uptown. My hope and wish is we never move that line, uh, at least in the near future. Uh, not never, never is a, for, that doesn't, no time in the near future do we move that line. Here's why. One, I'm a big proponent of redevelopment and infill locations. We have a lot out west and in this, this central core area, not in Palmetto, that we've got old motels falling down, we have old tire shops. Somebody needs to go and scrape those and build some real housing there, which helps with the blight and helps get the housing where our existing infrastructure is, our services are, where the employment centers are. It's not continuously further and further. Once you start filling those up, I can start having discussions out of these. Number two, if you are going to keep building out of these, that's on you and you should pay for it. If I move that line tomorrow to the other side, even to say 675, right? All of that stuff that was just approved all now falls west of the line. Now you don't get a developer building two lanes of road and putting in some pipes. You are building all of it. So it's going to be very expensive to, if somebody proposes and if a board actually moves that line, you have to understand that is dollar for dollar hitting your pocket tremendously solely based on what's already been approved previously. That's why that line cannot move. It's If nothing else, it is a financial requirement that that line stays for. And with our underfunded impact, we don't have, yes. we don't have on top money. of that, we can't do what we've got. What will happen, happen is, because the people building out there really want those roads, those roads will find a way to get built. Mm -hmm. It's the other roads that are like, yeah. you all can wait a little longer. So that line, that line, God willing, will not move in the near future because we can't afford to move that line. Well, and Burnside is still owned by the contractor or the developers? SMR still has control of that as part of their stewardship district. Right. Um, so they built all the sidewalks. They built, there are some parts of it that the county is now paying to improve ahead of time. There's some roundabouts and things going in at, at Rangeland and 44th, and I think the state's doing the one up at 64. So there are some improvements that the county is taking, but the actual road itself and the sidewalk, they have a big like 12 foot sidewalk that eventually God willing to be part of my trail system I've been begging for for three years. Uh, that was all paid for by SMR as part of their stewardship district through their CDD funds. So that's why it's completely closed so for the next uh, <laughs> over, I think yeah. he said. Because the roundabouts and stuff are going in and it's not utilized enough where it didn't make sense not just to close it and get it done. We can get it done a lot faster and cheaper if we just shut down the traffic and do it. Instead of one lane here, one lane here, redirecting people. It, it wasn't overly utilized because Taylor Ranch to the east isn't done yet. People can get around it going down Irvine and, and cutting down 44th and Rye and Rangeland and stuff. So I think that'll be safe too. Me too. <laughs> Honestly, that road, that road was, that because it wasn't used, that road quickly, very quickly became notorious with MSO as the place for all the high school kids to race. Right? Because it was a straight road with no traffic calming whatsoever. So they would park cars out there every Friday, Saturday night just to watch the kids drag race down there. So mm -hmm. that was a dangerous road that needed, because that's part of the problem is everyone thinks, hey, it's so cheap just to build a straight road. Why put curves in? Because it's dangerous. And it's dangerous to build straight roads where, where your line of sight is so far down without any traffic calming. Uh, we just increased the speed on rangeland, and I was the only one who said no. Okay, I know everyone likes faster speed limits, but I mean, Rangeland from Lakewood Ranch to, to Irvine, it's, we, we, we've got a new school going in there. We've got soccer fields for little kids there. We've got a library there. Why increase that speed? Is it really killing anybody? Is anybody late for anything? Because they had to go five miles an hour slower. They're not anyway. <laughs> 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 
so what difference does it make? Everyone wants to get every place faster and instead of getting every place safer. If everyone just drove every place safer, I guarantee you'd still get there faster. Because you wouldn't have all the accidents. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I have just a fundamental question. SMR, when I moved here in 
before they ever sell a house and the because they care piece. about it. And so that's the advantage of, of a Lakewood ranch. And you're seeing it like Lake Forest, or now it's called Sunfire, or something, not called Sunfire, Sand. It, it, it's out by Elk and Peace that are around there. They're doing a big plank community, and they're going to put everything in at it. Uh, North River Ranch oh, up yeah, here. Those are all four lane roads and amenity Seafire. parks and Seafire. commercial roads. There's an advantage to it. Uh, some people don't like them because it's very uniform and they, they would argue boring, but there is an advantage to it in terms of the amenities and the quality of it. So, uh, Lakewood Branch did it the right way, and I think they proved it because they're the fastest selling neighborhood in the country for like a decade straight. Oh, yeah. So, why can't the county care in the same way about what one development is versus the next development? Versus their infrastructure. Because we don't own it's all of the land around it because of private property rights. Some are own the land next to it, know the land next to it, know the land next to it. So they can care because it's all their property. They don't. They didn't have to do it. They could have just said, yeah. sell each parcel to the highest bidder, do what you want. You got a gas station next to a rock crushing plant next to a school. <laughs> Who cares? But they own all of it, so they can do it. We don't own anything. Everyone else owns everything. We just have to make sure we're balancing your private property rights with your private property rights with your private property rights within the, the confines of the law. So we do, in fact, when we approved that car wash, going back to a previous example, our argument was, hey, the, you've got an apartment complex getting built around you. I don't think that apartment complex is gonna like you building a car. It's gonna, the car is gonna be right next to the pool. All right, we don't think you're gonna like that. What do they do? They literally went back to the owner who, of the land who's building that apartment complex and got a letter from that owner saying that they were okay with the car wash. And they presented us that letter before we approved it. So we do consider it. Uh, but again, it's within the, I can't just blindly, I'm not God, I can't just take away people's rights just because I feel like it. SMR owns all the rights, so they are allowed to do what they want. Uh, the reason they're able to put the roads in, before someone asks this question, inevitably, uh, how come we can't put four lane roads in and parks in before we approve anything? They have money. We don't. Uh, they're voting bonds. So that's like CDDs. Before I moved into Greyhawk, all the roads were in. The pool was in. There wasn't a whole lot of house there, but all of that was in because they floated the bonds first. They floated $100 million worth of the bonds, built everything, and now I'm paying the bond back as my share of my CDD. That's essentially what SMR is doing. We don't have the bonding capacity to that extent for a county wide to be able to put all of those roads in. Um, we use impact fees. The problem with so, impact fees so is. So SMR had the bonding capacity, but the county doesn't have the bonding capacity? They're building on a much, much smaller canvas than the, the entirety of the county. Yeah. So, yes. Uh, we use impact fees. The problem with impact fees is they get paid when you pull permits. So people are like, why don't you put a road in before you approve that house? Like, I don't even get the money until they start building that house. There's only so fast I can build a road. And until you sell all those houses, I can't, I can't do it. It's, it's a problem, it's a different funding source. That's why you see, go back to Faulkner, they just created a stewardship district. Uh, like I said, Artisan Lakes, Heritage Harbor, North River Ranch, University Park. They're all stewardship district or massive ma like, uh, master CDDs. That gives them, they have to get approval from the state to be that, to qualify for their credit and, and their financial capacity. But then they're able to go out and float the bonds. They take the risk on the bonds to build it, assuming they're gonna sell the houses and each parcel gets their proportional share of that bond that they have to pay. That's how they can do it. This leads me to my next sort of moment. So a big developer, of course, like SMR, plans that can not the county, when they're looking at smaller parcels and more individual property owners, does that mean they are funding and building? Create ideas to maintain that area and ask the owners to band together. Yes and no. And write their own restrictions. Or yes and no. Yes and no. I get your answer. There's a yes and no in two parts to that. One, we can plan to some extent, and to some extent, albeit very dated, we did, because there's three documents that dictate how we approve things. One is the comp plan, which tells you what you can build. The other is the land development code, which tells you how you can build it. And the third one is the future land use map, which the intent of that was what you're kind of referring to. It basically said, let's look at all the parcels and say, this is what this can be zoned for somewhere down the road. When you want to rezone that piece of ag, you can rezone it for three houses per acre. When you want to rezone that piece, you can rezone it for commercial. So there was some thought. 
Um, what you're kind of referring to is more form-based code, which we don't have. It's a much better way. It's very hard to do on a county-wide basis. The city of Brainton has form-based code. That basically says, hmm, we're not even over really concerned with kind of what you build there. Just this is the height and the look and the facade, and this is the, the density and the, the footprint. Now we'll build some stuff. Uh, it keeps it all uniform. It keeps it, it, it's, it's a cleaner way of building. You see that in things like the Woodlands and Houston. Mm -hmm. um, we do have, go to your kind of second question. We do have a framework for everyone to band together and, and say it. Uh, they're called overlays. It's the closest thing we have. It's not exactly what you're referring to, but it's the closest thing. Um, we used to have one up here, North Central Overlay. Um, There's a parish the one. Uh, what's that? Parish has one. Yeah, the parish has the, the little one in the neighborhood. Okay. Okay. And I worked on it along with a tip to help fund it. Um, that allows the neighbors to kind of get together. The problem is you have to get everyone to agree to it. Um, otherwise, it doesn't really work. There's a few, there's two places right now that are talking about some form of overlay. One is Mayaka, one is Elwood Park, uh, more towards Central Green over there, uh, just off of 44th. And then Cortez has dabbled with it. The problem is what, you know, you have to get all the neighbors to agree to it. And if some neighbor is ready to sell their big parcel of land to a condo developer, they're not going to agree to it. Um, you have to get by it. But there is some framework. When, when North Central Overlay and Parish Shores was here, and that's why, what is it, the 7 Eleven has the quirky roof? And that's why nobody can find the Dollar Tree? Because <laughs> that, that overlay was so <laughs> like You had to put like massive trees and set your commercial so far back off the road that nobody built commercial and you couldn't find the stuff that wasn't built. That's why all there is is like 17 pizza places here. Um, and there's also sewage issues. But yeah, so there is a framework for it, but it's an overlay. We, it's, they're, they're few and far between. And they don't really do what you are asking about, but they're, they're the closest thing we have. And that can set design, like the ones up here, set design restrictions and setback restrictions and offering restrictions. So it allowed for some uniformity within the area. If you, if you want to clarify, no one else raised your hand. No questions. You've asked enough questions. <laughs> this is about the comprehensive plan. Um, I was from upstate New York and lived in a small community, and our community was basically farming, residential farming, apple country. So the town had a comprehensive plan that they used to revisit every year and they would modify it depending on what was going on in the community and what I second. are you leaving yes sir all right here make sure I get my, your contact information I do want to look that up okay find out about your duty calls <laughs> so yeah shoot me, just shoot me an email I'll look it up okay I appreciate it oh, thank you very much so my question is when Manatee County approves all these developments, it seems like there should be some component of a comprehensive plan to revisit it and to evaluate the impact of all this development within the community. And it seems like there's no method to do that. Yeah, here's well, we're, we're kind of going through that method now. Um, in theory, you're supposed to revisit your town plan like every um, some people will argue we do uh, on Facebook, but the reality is we haven't meaningfully revisited it in a long time. Uh, so the intent is, this, these are supposed to be living, breathing documents that do get revisited because the first comp plan was done in 1989. Like Laker Ranch was just kind of like a glimmer and maybe a couple of houses in the country club at that point in time. Like things have changed dramatically. We need to be looking and saying, okay, uh, here's here's what we did, here's what we broke, here's how we screwed up or did right these past five or ten years. Now let's redo these documents so we can factor all this in. Now we know the trajectory of growth, we know the trajectory of where the developments are happening. How do we update it so we make sure that the next five or ten years are being built properly in accordance with it? We haven't done a good job of that. There hasn't been a good job of learning from the past to fix the future. We haven't done a good job of acknowledging what's occurred in the past to make sure what happens in the future conforms to it. So we're supposed to do every 10 years. We are actively doing it right now. Like we started that process last year. We just had our first 
work session on it it's three weeks ago, four weeks ago. That's being worked on as we speak. Um, they are seemingly trying to get it done before November, <laughs> probably for a good reason. Um, <laughs> Hopefully they do not, uh, because that's where that, that's going to have conversation about the future development area boundary. That's going to have conversation about incentives and, and density and things like that. Um, but it hasn't come back yet. But it is actively. My next question is regarding the anti-poverty <laughs> website. <laughs> okay. I could be so because that would answer my sort of question. Okay. Um, this is about the Community County website. You can go on the website and go to the government section and then go to the Board of Commissioners and then bring up a, a menu, submit a public comment. And then you can fill out a form to comment on an issue that's going to be presented before the Planning Board or the Board of Commissioners. Is that a waste of time? Like, do those get read, or do they get thrown in the garbage? And depends on the commissioner. The person to address them to when you have. Is it better to like regarding this pillar development? I want to do a, a comment, a public comment. Should I send that's it on, to? That's on the agenda right now. Though. Well, it's going to be August fifteenth. It's coming. Yeah, I know, but that's and, that's far. I'm saying like the gym is usually opposed to like 10 days out. So right. commenting on something in August at the end of the summer is probably premature. No one's going to really overly remember that. And that's just the planning commission. So which means it wouldn't come to us until the end of August, beginning of September before it actually gets to our board because we go after the planning. Right. September 5th. September 5th. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to be out of town. Sorry. I'm not going to be out of town. I'll be zooming in. I'll be zooming in. But do um, those get read and who do they actually go to? Okay, two things. Um, if they get read, it's entirely at the discretion. They go to every, all of us. Every, all commissioners get those. Emails. And what about the people on the planning board? Like, there's a planning board meeting. If, if you send it to the planning board, it goes, here's any, any comment that comes in. 72 hours before the planning commission meeting mm -hmm. gets attached to their agenda oh. so it's public record forever you can go look at the public records from three years ago on some development that somebody sent an email about that's public record if you get it on time uh, if it gets in 72 hours before our meeting then it goes on our agenda and those comments get saved forever as public record and they all come to our inbox. I'm, I've never been on the planning commission, but presumably those emails go to the planning commissioners as well. They get submitted during that time period. I can't speak to that. Um, I read every single one of them. I can't respond to them, and sometimes that frustrates people but because of the quasi-judicial. I can't respond, but I do read them all. Um, whether or not it's a waste of time, I don't think anything's a waste of time if you try to get your voice heard by your government. Um, does it sometimes feel like it's a waste of time because we'll get hundreds of emails saying one thing and the decisions the other? I mean, I got thousands of emails about the wetland offers. Thousands, oh, thousands. And that obviously didn't work. That was a 6 1 vote. Um, that was disgusting. But I, I'll never say it's a waste of time. I read them. I have to think or hope some other people read them. Um, where we go with it is at the discretion of the board. At the end of it. <laughs> but there are things like I'll get some emails, very pointed emails, saying this is the exact problem, and I research that to determine whether or not it's a problem. If it is, I brought it up, or at least I use some of those emails. If someone says, "Here's this problem," "Here's this problem," I'll make sure to ask those questions. If you watch some of the, the land use meetings, I will specifically go, "What about that eagle over there?" What about this thing over here? And make them answer the questions that the public have because I have more ability to ask them questions than say someone getting kicked off of a Zoom meeting. Because mm -hmm. I have to answer my questions. <laughs> <laughs> it must be so frustrating being your position. Especially with the wetlands. That was a good one. <laughs> She's making me talk. No, <laughs> I live in Harrison Ranch, and they're building uh, 320 or 360 to 390 apartments, 100 yards from my house. And when we went to the commissioners' meeting, what surprised me is that the questions that we threw out were kind of ignored, only from the sense that when we talked about the amount of traffic, oh, 
it won't impact and traffic won't impact you whatsoever as well so you're looking at 360 apartments possibly two two cars per apartment mm -hmm. then you're on top of it and you know and i have the schematics that somebody sent to me what it's going to look like behind my house and it, it, it's frustrating i mean it, it that we weren't even nothing was told to us ahead of time nothing was said to us ahead of time. i mean we have a, we have villas and it would be nice that maybe they could have that we were told a long time ago or i was when i bought in in 2015 that yes that property was up for sale when they're looking to build villas there we're going to match it <laughs> that didn't happen now not on top of that i heard on the news the other night um, through the county commissioners want to consolidate fire stations and manatee where we live there's no hook and ladder truck uh -huh. so you're right now we have a three-story apartment down the street there's going to be three to four story behind me there's some up there closer farther down on 301 and there's not even a three now they want to consolidate so you're taking away mm -hmm. our i think you're thinking this the wrong up the wrong way let me answer i'm question. sorry the fire station they're going yeah. but, and, and they did bring they the consolidation they actually I, i'm just saying because the consolidation portion of it would actually help that problem not hurt that problem that's why i, want to I clarify. think it will hurt it no, because no, you're not going to be explain, explain. they're not going to be close by the closest hook and ladder truck does okay it's then, then, you're, then there's, a, there's a misunderstanding the, the consolidation doesn't mean shut down stations and consolidate trucks to a location. It means we've got East River, we got East Manatee fire, we used to have Mayaka fire, we got Duet fire, we got Parish fire, we got North River fire. That's just in this area. Then you start getting Cedar Hammock, you start getting Trailer States, you start getting West Bradenton. All those are independent taxing districts. They're all independent fire departments to buy whatever trucks they want, hire whatever people they want, do whatever training they want. They are all independent. They charge their people the same amount. When people refer to consolidation, the, 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 the comments are East Manatee has two ladder trucks. You have zero ladder trucks. Consolidating just means instead of maybe having a parish fire and a duet fire and East Manatee fire, maybe there should just be an East Manatee fire area and that way there could be a ladder truck up by you and a ladder truck down there because it's all one fire department that happens to have multiple. Or maybe it's North River fire and parish fire and duet fire for a North River fire. North River has ladder trucks. It's not consolidating me making less stations and putting them con and consolidating the people and the trucks. It may consolidate the, the operations and organization. organization. It wouldn't. You wouldn't lose any. If, if anything, you would gain stations and gain equipment and gain people and training. It's that's not what consolidation meant. Consolidation was strictly at the organizational level, not at the operational level. Okay. In my ear, I was misunderstood. Yeah, I'm just clarifying. And to be fair, what the commissioners do, and I've had this conversation with with many of the fire chiefs, we have absolutely no say now as well because we're a non-charter county. They're independent taxing districts. We cannot consolidate them. We cannot tell them what to do. We cannot do anything to them. They have their own impact fees. They have their own taxes. They have their own board. They have their own chiefs. They are controlled entirely by the state, not by the county. We have no say in what any of those fire districts do or do not do, whether it be consolidation or independent operation. But before even a developer comes in and says, we want to build a three-story apartment building we want to build 360 individual apartments there. Yeah. so do they even look what is available in the name in no the no developers required to look to see what the fire department has before they decide what to build i mean by that logic i can just if, if i really if i was a fire chief and hated development i'd shut down all my fire stations just you can't build anything there's no fire station here it, it, it's the onus is on the, the the fire department to provide just like the school like the onus isn't on the developer to say well i'm not going to build until the school gets around to chart you know to, to building the school they build and now the onus on the school same thing everyone's yelling at me about roads it's like well I have to build as fast as I can build roads, but developers aren't, can't get held up over that. So it, it's, a, it's a give and take. So first off, they can put out three-story fire. I've talked to Stacy and Mike Williamson. They can put out three, it's the four-story. When they get to the four stories, where the problem is. There was a four-story apartment approved on year E. It hasn't been built, but it's been approved uh, years ago. Um, but they can put out three stories. 
but yes, that's why the, the consolidation part came in was because it makes more efficiency. Uh, you have Sarasota is one fire department, Palm Beach is one fire department. Then you have others like Pinellas, like 15, because like every other street's its own city in Pinellas. Um, so it's it's a give and take. It's a conversation, but it's not a conversation for us. That would have to be done at the state level, not at our level, or voluntarily. Myaka voluntarily merged with East Manatee. They chose to do that because they understood they couldn't provide the proper services for Myaka. They still have to get the state approval to do it. As for Harrison Ranch, I don't really. That's been more than thirty days. Right? It has. That was back like February, March. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that was a that was a terrible provide. I voted no on that. And that was a four story apartment complex. Yeah, I voted I voted no on that. Um, it was previously approved for commercial, um, so you're going to get something built there. This wasn't one of these like Terra where it's like, hey, this is open space or Savannah dealt with it open space. There was approvals already in place from like what was it, 2018 or 16. I remember it was to build something. There. We knew that. the question was what yeah. was going to be built. That. And I and I I argued to my staff that there's no way that traffic matched up. It's like how come what, how come one one study says one apartment is equal to ten thousand square feet of commercial, but then you show up with a different study that says one apartment is equal to fifteen hundred square feet of commercial? Like you're just making it up. You're fighting on how many units that they want to build, and then you're dividing it by the potential commercial square feet. I I, I agree with you. That's that was a bad decision. Um, that's certainly more traffic than you would have otherwise gotten. You only have two e grades. Area. And what's coming right it? off of Harrison Ranch yeah. to get to it? Oh. Uh, I, we're going to have to do a yeah, U turn. We're going to have to do a U turn. Yeah. And it'll be the U turns right in front of our entrance to where yeah. we were. There's going to have to be meaningful fixes to Harrison mm -hmm. Ranch Boulevard as a whole because that's being connected all the way up. That's, 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 that's right. connecting yeah. further north. That's going to have more traffic. It, 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 we have to make improvements to the intersection of 301. We're going to have to make adjustments. And that. you were talking that they were not allowed to take, that they had to leave so many trees and right. things. Yeah, well, the development on the other side where they're building the storage and the standalone, they take them way more than 75%. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. That's, that's not what that 75% was strictly for the entryway. Yeah. It is the entryway. Yeah, that's what I'm about. But again, they can get approval. All, you get, you get, all clear. It's all clear. You can get, you get, a, you, you get stipulation approvals for anything. Yeah. Um, the one nice thing about the self storage is those things are quiet. I know. Everyone was complaining about one of them. But I think they're, 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 not the, they're not the best looking thing. I don't think it's the best use of land. But everyone's like, they're going to they want to take down this apartment and build a self storage next to my, my house. Good. I wish self storage would get built. Next time. Nobody ever goes there at night. There's no lights, there's no windows. No one's looking in your backyard or your pool. No, people go there like twice a year. Once to pick up their Christmas decorations and once to pick up <laughs> Some stories is like the lowest intense thing you can have next to your neighborhood. <laughs> My opinion. <laughs> so should we ask for some storage? No, 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 no. God no. <laughs> well, I'm not saying I walk more. I'm just saying if someone's going to build something next to my neighbor, I'm sorry. Hey, I live in I live in Gray Alpha. I had a previous board right before I got on for a car dealership. What's happening with that, by the way? Nothing right now. I heard they bought the land next to them, immediately to the west, where that one girl lives. Yes, um, thank God. But they haven't done Thank you. Um, my guess is they were going to have a lot of flooding problems, a lot of wetland problems. I, if I had to guess, I don't know. My guess is they're having problems getting the permits and approval to do it, which is great. Um, but nothing's happening. They won their lawsuit. But they won, they won their case. Uh, yeah. So they're allowed to build it. They, it was held up in court, but they haven't. I, I haven't even seen like survey states. I think we still deal with her. <laughs> you will ask her if she is not. Would you know anything about the property right across the street here that somebody was going to try to develop and put? Um, 80 slip marina and nine stories yeah. and that got pulled. Car. That got on the agenda, off the agenda. I have not seen another word about it. So I don't know if they just because look, look, a lot of the developments we've seen in the past, financing costs are very expensive right now. There's a lot of stuff that was going to get built when interest rates were two and three percent to build a mm -hmm. hotel or something. When they're now eight to ten percent. 
that doesn't mean that thing's gone away. It just could not make financial sense in the current climate, and it's being kind of put on the shelf until it makes more sense to do so. I have not heard an update on that. I remember when it was being proposed, but you're the first person to mention that to me and over here. So I have no idea. But nothing's being done now. Right now, it's still a city. Yeah, I just, um, I, I, I just want to express, I, I think the local government needs to lead, and you're going to have a lot of NIMBY um, whenever things are changing. And, and the example I, I recall vividly is the Fort Hammer Bridge. When they first went to build Fort Hammer, that was one guy. Um, <laughs> it was going to be four lanes, and they were going to four lane to it, and four lane up out of it, and everybody who was anywhere near there was up in arms, especially this north side of the river, did not want that bridge. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, and so, and then some uh, people with heavy weights with the governor got to. Uh, <laughs> that was the guy, that was, that was the guy down Waterleaf who said there was some like endangered fish or something. Yeah, well, yeah. he got the <laughs> governor. <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> was was waiting for my dad. He really didn't want it to be a freeway. That would go by his development uh, by Isn't the that side back of his development. It was he remotely would have mm. impacted him, other than to give us a better north south connection. Um, but so that delayed it for I don't know 50 five, if not a decade. It also made it cost more money because and then, eventually, then, eventually, then, eventually, eventually the, the county up. built it themselves instead of waiting for the federal money. So then finally, the compromise was we'll make it two lanes. Um, and and now we're going to do another. Now we're going to finally put the other two lane bridge across. What is it going to cost now? As it would have been fifteen or twenty years ago. I can't remember how long it was. But I was at those. Who knows? Those uh, public Let's meetings too. Yeah. And and I had a very old lady as we were walking out, and she says, "This will get it put off." So I'm dead. I don't care. No, I said, Thank you very much, man. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to give you else in this county. <laughs> we are working on getting the other two lanes there, uh, the other half of the bridge. It'll be done as a separate two-lane bridge, so it's not going to shut down the current one. So it's not going to cause it'll cause problems, but it won't be it won't shut it down long right. term. It's just a right. separate bridge. Um, but what is the cost? The, the cost that ten or fifteen years that have gone a lot. Uh, right now, I believe the I think just the four lane for Hamer was nine figures, um, and then you got the bridge. We don't have any numbers yet because we're supposed to be doing all the the design work and the planning and the budgeting for it. We requested five million dollars from the state as part of our appropriation this year three for i think the bridge and two for the road to do design work and yesterday they were both vetoed uh so we didn't get that one yeah they got um, 50 million out of yeah oh really so, yeah. Um, so what we are working on probably because people that the governor appoints and bears because the intent of fort hammer is like if oh, anyone's seen the long get term. nothing because you got stupid people that make you put it in there that, that road was always there so because that road becomes Upper Bounty, which becomes Lake Ridge Boulevard, which goes all the way down to Lake Ridge, all the way to, to Fruitville down there. The, and it, north of it goes all the way up to North River Branch. The ultimate intent is to get that all the way up into Hillsboro and become, ideally, an interchange for the interstate. Because then you can hit that, now probably be like 237-ish, call it, like south of Sun City, north of Moxwell. And then you could literally pop off and shoot straight down to Sarasota. Um, if there's accidents anywhere between there on Ellington or 275, you can bypass that by shooting straight down. If you have evacuation situations, you can bypass the 275 cut right there and shoot straight out. So it creates a lot of safety and traffic benefits in the long term, but it's not going to do any good if you go from four lanes to two lanes across the bridge and back to four lanes. You're not using that for an evacuation of anything. So it's a very important road. It, the board is made that outside of finishing 44 which just has the flyover left right uh and getting mocks and all the done fort hammer is kind of the, the next number one thing um that is being focused on who else help me by so i had an opportunity to uh to a piney point today 
and um, the injection well, which is owned by the county, the, everything else is not owned by the county, but the injection well is owned by the county. And uh, it's my understanding that they have to uh, monitor it for about 50 years after it closes down. And that the uh, EPA allowed a permitting for only the water coming from Piney Point, right. nothing else. But I was also told that there's allied chemical over there that may have already worked out a deal or had previously talked about working out a deal. We're going to deal for a different injection well over by Buffalo Creek. Okay, so it was a different one. So there's no intention by the county or any other deals that are pending or may pend in the future. Not to me. Regarding that was a promise, that was okay. a promise we made to the county when we had that discussion about cleaning the water or injecting the water or God knows what we're going to do with that water because there was no good answer. There was only less bad answers. Part of the discussion on the board at that time was a commitment by the board at that time that only water from Piney Point would go down that well and then that well would be capped. Because there was even discussion, oh, this you could make up some of the money from it. That's one of the reasons the county kept it instead of the state. Because the state, if they took control of it, would have had a right to put other stuff down okay. and monetize it to recoup money. That's one of the reasons the county kept control of it with the promise it would only go there. Ally Chemical did come because clearly dumping it down there makes sense. They're next door. They're, they're part right. of the Right, or else they'd have to land. ship it over the East Coast. Or yeah. that's what they were doing. They were yes. going to uh, Lake Platte. Somewhere out there. Um, the the deal we worked out with them was they're now paying us to use the well that we built. And all it is is brine water from them. And we already had an injection well built by Buffalo Creek because of the future potential reverse osmosis plant, which was already permitted to basically put the same water down the well that Allied wanted to put down. So we allowed them to have a contract for that well, not the piney well. Okay. Um, in light of everything we've talked about, everything we know about this explosive growth, has there ever been any consideration of a, a moratorium for a year, say, for example, to kind of just stop the development and let's just get some infrastructure done, let's relook at our best practices, best way to approach this? I mean, I know what the answer is, I think, yes, but the right. <laughs> <laughs> no. The look that he's giving you should <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, six here's, 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 here's a couple of things. Here's a couple of things. Could you have a board that just in and of itself says, hey, look, you, this is what you're zoned for, you can build what you're zoned for, does that create a pseudo, yes. I'm not going to say moratorium, yeah. but does that slow things because you're allowing people, yeah, true. you can't have a, I'm at no point in my life would I ever consider a moratorium. First okay. off, economically speaking, physically speaking, just <laughs> common sense, it's like having rent control. Like it never actually works. It sounds well, Hillsborough, really, Hillsborough did it. Yeah. Well, they did well, it. Well, <laughs> first off, Hillsborough did not do it. They did a very small piece of South Hillsboro, yeah. not the entire oh, yeah, true, true. So long, yeah. And you yeah. know what happened? I can tell you exactly what happened. All those developers built someplace else in Hillsboro. If they did not slow growth in one bit, they just slow growth in one select little area. Yeah, and people that yelled at them until an election was over, and then they pulled it. But yeah. that didn't slow down anything. It didn't stop population. They did not do it. Uh, people have personal property rights. And if it's zoned a certain way today, then you have some reasonable belief to assume you can use your property as that. Do you have a right to believe you can do more than that? No. If someone zoned R3 and you can build three houses per acre and you want to come to me and say, can I build nine houses per acre so I can build an apartment complex, say no. this board has every legal right to say no. Mm -hmm. We have some incentives in place already with affordable housing bonuses and mixed use, but you can go from three to six because that's already in the comp plan. Um, but you do not have an inherent right to build more than what you're already allowed to build. So could you have a board say, okay, let's just, what you're allowed, you're allowed until we figure all this out? Sure. You can do that legally. You can do that and still allow for proper growth. Um, could you legally just tell everyone, I don't care what your property's zoned for? No. I mean, by that logic, someone just bought a parcel of land out in Mayaka, they're going to put their home in to retire. It's like, nope, sorry, we're not giving you permits. With moratorium, you better just stay up in Connecticut for another year. <laughs> no, that's that, that, that would be illegal and we would never yeah, get away with that. Yeah. Um, it has nothing to do with tax base mm -hmm. or anything else. It has to do with legality of personal property rights and my fundamental belief you can use your property to the extent. But that doesn't mean you you need to be able to use it beyond that. 
And if you stopped all development for a year and you think housing prices are through the roof now, yeah. if you think we're behind on uh, infrastructure now, if you think rent prices are high now, shut a year's worth of all forms of development and supply down and see what happens. I mean, it's, it's not going to get better. Yeah. So, so if you were to do a grade to the current um, Board of County Commissioners and the administration for getting job done that balances the needs of current residents, new people coming in, and developers, what kind of a grade would you give it right now? Big fat app. That's a tough question. Because first of all, that's, that's very broad. There, they are, there are a lot of things that I believe our board is doing well. I, I think we've given a bigger focus to affordable workforce housing. We built more in the past 24, or approved more in the past 24 months than the previous eight years. Um, and that's certainly helping in terms of teachers and other people. It's uh, our, our rents are still through the roof and going up, but that's not unique to Manatee County. Yet. I think there's been a lot of effort on things like parks. Washington Park is now back up and running after we got our environmental issues done. Parish Park right here next to the high school. Phase one's well on its way. It should hopefully get done by the end of this year. Then phase two's going. Hidden Harbor's going. We're working on a new boat ramp. So I, I think some of these, the Lakewood Ranch Library just opened up. It's our first new library in God knows how long. The next step is an expansion of this library, 8,000 square feet of expansion to Rocky Bluff. So there are some things that are, that are going well. I think this board has been way too lenient on development rights, um, which isn't just a matter of giving too much away for development. It also gives a perception of leniency. Uh, so when you see the clear cutting happen, you see all the dust clouds happen, when you see things being skirted from, from neighborhood meetings and things like that, I think it's because people get the sense that the perception is they can pretty much do what they want because the board's gonna let you do what you want. You need to be a little firmer on some of that stuff. Uh, I, it all starts and ends with, the, with how the board acts and the board's acting like you can do anything you want. People always hide behind, we have an affordable housing issue so we just need more. Yeah, I understand your very, very basic assumption of supply and demand. Um, it's got validity, but that's not the be all end all to it. Um, there's more to it than that. You can't just say, just build more, we're gonna fix affordable housing. You're not. Um, you need to build it in the right place and the right type and you need to be able to accommodate people with services. So. From general stuff, I think we're doing well. I think we're overtaxing relative to the services provided. Um, in part because I think we're not providing forward-facing services to the citizens. We, we've gotten a very bloated, top-heavy government right now that's eating away at dollars that should be better spent. Um, so I always get frustrated when people ask for more employees, but I just had this discussion in my life. People are asking for a new headcount, but every, every single person they asked for was called a supervisor, a manager, a director, a deputy director. Nobody came to me and said, can I have six more librarians so I can open a library on Sunday? Like, that's something public wants. No, nobody, no, nobody in the public sitting home like, I really wish there was like eight supervisor for the permitting department. It doesn't affect your life at all. Uh, so we could yeah, yeah. we could much more, much better utilize your taxes to actually improve the services to you. I, I think we we're doing a good job. I think the services being provided to you are, are good. But I've been on this board for four years. We haven't added a single route to a transit. We haven't added a single hour to library services. Um, we haven't expanded services, but we've expanded population tremendously. So there's more people clamoring for services, and we're just happy with where we were. Uh, so we need to refocus those tax dollars. So I would give us a C. solid B on some things and a C to C minus on others. I'll go with that. From a development standpoint, I give it much worse. But I mean, that's that's on that's on the board. I'm not in any way anti-growth or anti-development. I just think it needs to be put in right place. Um, I'm the first one to say I'll give you the height and the density if you put it in the right place. If, if the developers for DeSoto Square Mall, who act, they're actively working on their plan, they can come in as for almost anything. Like if you put enough stuff there, that's the right place. I got four and six lane roads around you. I got massive pipes going in there. You're on street thoroughfares. You're walking slash e-bike distance from enough employment center for all of you. Give me some good mixed use there. I'll be very accommodating for a roof. If you want to keep building three houses per acre until you hit the the border over here out east, it's like, that's just not, that's not good use because I can't, I can never provide you this. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to re-ask my question. What can I do 
what tell me where to go what to do who to get in front of to make something happen vote better people in that is the answer. That's November. Save yourselves. No. Yeah. August. From Alton yeah. County. Oh, right. I'm right. excited in the primary. Right. Oh, I can't go right. back. Sure. Sure. I'm not allowed in the not being campaigning. Well, you're not campaigning. We're just making comments. <laughs> Um, how you do it is talk to your, honestly, uh, I'll answer your actual question, um, because that's the glossy answer. The real answer is, I'm that's just, really I am accessible to everyone. I speak three times a week. I do you're the only one, though. You're the only one. one. That's right, but, but I pester people within the county about We've people. showed up, oh. we've showed up at the meetings, we've showed, we have done, like, we have done it. I, I'm saying, talk to me, take my card. Talk to me about problems. I will bring them to public. I literally got a roundabout built on El Conquist's door because like six people were having a hard time getting out of their neighborhood. Now I got a roundabout. <laughs> like I will talk to people about stuff. I will try to push to get things done. I've gotten speed bumps put in. I've got a street light put in. I got a roundabout put in. I've gotten the, 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 the park over here by the, the boat ramp at Fort Hamer. We added that extra parking because people said, I don't have any place to park my trailer. I got us to create the parking lot for it because a couple of people didn't have a place to put their trailer in the three days the other parking lot was full. I didn't care. I got it done. Yeah, so talk to me. I will bring it in front of staff. I mean, as much as I like to think 430,000 people in Manatee County have an equal voice when it comes to talking to your government, the reality is you don't. Um, but I've got a voice and a connection and ability to speak to people and I will advocate for people if they bring something to me and I agree with the, with the premise of what you're trying to do and I understand your concern I will bring it in front I'm the one who went and sat in multiple people's houses in Foxbrook and looked at their lanalis looked at all the dust coming out of all these things toward all of these developments and brought that on an agenda item on the, the for the board and started making the changes to our development plans to make sure that didn't continue happening in the future because I went and talked to people in Foxburg. So reach out to me and let's well, discuss what's your problem. It had a larger impact because uh, Neil of okay. now. Hey, hey, we're just speaking out of turn. How <laughs> 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 impact does Neil now has sodded his construction yes. site? Oh, we, we have. Uh, well, that's because, that's because we put the new rules in. He was the actually the rules in. And again, like I said, part of the perception is the board's very lenient on things, which is why it happens. We put new rules in, and like a week or two later, all the dust came up again. So we called Development Services and said, you better fix this. we got to prove that these are real rules. We red tagged almost every single thing. started on him. And now he's got saw and I showed water trucks out there. All those developments that it cost like they're telling us it costs them about seventy-five thousand dollars a day to be shut down. Talk about and we red tagged them all. Whenever he wants, whenever he wants. All of a sudden, they all found water trucks. They all found sod. It was amazing what they could do when they realized we were actually going to shut them down and live with what we told them we were going to do. And there's still some problems. But there's a couple of developers that just are. That's the problem with finding anybody. It's like finding someone for pollution. If they've got enough money, they just make it into the cost. That's, now it's an expense, and they just don't pollute. And now they feel they can pollute because they're paying the fine. Uh, so there are some developers that are kind of still kind of skirting our rules. But most of them, especially the local ones, uh, like not the national, they're doing a, a much better job. Not perfect, but better. And now it's raining every day, so it's almost a non uh, it was a whole list of things, a uh, maximum amount of acreage you could clear at any one time. And if you weren't going to use a parcel for a certain period of time, you had to sod it or seed it. Um, if winds are over 15 miles an hour, because like steady or 25 mile an hour does, they weren't allowed to work where it would unsettle dirt. That's all it was. It was just a, yeah, it was a really code that's part of their permitting. So they all just submit land clearing proposals to us. Um, yeah, yeah, and to submit it, and we had to approve it. And going forward, all future developments, that's going to be effectively stapled to their permit. They have to submit that and approve that before we issue a permit to start clearing the land. And then we can monitor it. That way, if they don't do it, we can actually point to a document. Right now, it's been, it was all hypothetical. It was all subjective. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's now it's more specific. It's a yeah. you said you weren't going to do this, and you did do this. Now I have the recourse to shut you down. It literally just happened a few weeks. Ago.